a play by Somerset Maugham, who I think is one of our mo most shamefully neg neglected authors these days. And there was a screenplay by Howard Koch, who later went on to share an Oscar with the Epstein twins for Casablanca. And it's, it's, it is quite simply a melodrama. Um, it begins with a wonderful tracking shot through the Singapore rubber plantation on which it's set in the early part of last century. And the tracking shot goes through the plantation up to a bungalow and you hear a shot. The next thing you see is Bette Davis, pow, 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 firing bullets in, in, into a man's body. And the question the film asks and has to resolve is, was this murder or was it, as Bette Davis alleges, um, self-defense because the man had tried to, to rape her? The plot hinges around a mysterious letter which was sent to the dead man and is in the possession of his uh, Eurasian mistress. The thing is, though, that Bette Davis is at her imperious best in this film, that, uh, you know, she just dominates every scene she's in, you know, upstage everybody I'm on. And it's her performance and, and Wyler's direction that turn what, as I said, is, is really basic melodrama into a classic piece of cinema. Oh, Max Steiner's music helps as well. Something that you watched her when she was on the screen. You and, couldn't avoid it. And I think, too, it. you know, the notion, as you say, because I think was it one of the Warner Brothers or possibly Harry Cohn has said that she looked like Slim Somerville, you know. Yes, that's right. When yeah. uh, he was signing her contract. And there was a sort of indomitable quality about her. You know, the notion that she had worked to, to get where she was, you know, that because she yeah. wasn't a great beauty. I think, you know, perhaps uh, women identified more with her that I, I think I think they, they probably did because it was a hell of a lot harder for, for women to dominate in, in any field yeah. at that time. And in fact, I gather that on her, I haven't seen it, but on her tombstone in Forest Lawn, where else would she be buried, um, it says, and it was an inscription which was suggested to her by the wonderful director, Joe Mankovich. She did it the hard way. so, because there was no such thing as feminism in their day, mm. was there? Um, and yet, yeah, you know, people like Crawford, Stanek, and, and Bette Davis were the biggest, among the biggest, Garbo was another one, among the biggest stars and the biggest um, box office uh, money winners um, in, in Hollywood at that time. Well, and they, they were the kind of people who opened pictures. In other words, the the mere fact that they were in, in the cast meant that the film would open big on its, on its first weekend. What happened to it after that um, was never held against the star. When was it, 36, 37, when she, she, she didn't like the parts that were being offered to her? And she's quite right. She, I mean, she just won a couple of Oscars and she, they were offering her pretty rubbishy parts. So she came over to England to make a movie. And Warner Brothers sued her for a breach of contract. And in, in the court case, she said that, um, you know, she was like, like a slave, and they all were like slaves. And Patrick Hastings, Sir Patrick Hastings for Warner Brothers, um, said, well, how, how much are you earning? And she said, I think it was something like $1,400 a week, you know, which is an astronomical sum in those days. Yeah. Um, and he said, well, you know, I mean, for that kind of... Um, for that kind of money, I, I might contemplate um, a, a period of servitude. Um, <laughs> Sorry, that was one. Did you ever meet Betty Davis? Yes, I did, actually. I did meet Betty Davis once. I had tea with her at the, at the Savoy Hotel in London. And, and, and she was on terribly good behaviour, which was t really disappointing. <laughs> because I'd have loved, you know, to have an anecdote about, oh, Christ, you should have seen Betty Davis. Jesus, wow, everything they say about the truth. But she couldn't have been sweeter. I mean, she was absolutely charming, puffing away at her cigarettes. You know, I, I loved her for that. She just chain-smoked all the way through life.